Mr. President. The Senator from West Virginia is recognized. Mr. President, uh, how long am I recognized for? The Senator is recognized uh, until 11 o'clock. Mr. President, I have one hour, do I not? What's that? I ask you now, Mr. Consent, that I may proceed Without objection, for so the full hour. To which Without I was, objection, so ordered. Which I was allotted. Mr. President, uh, when I last uh, spoke on this subject, which was just before the memorial break, I spoke of the provocations by, by Tarentum, which resulted in the visitation by a Roman senator, Lucius Postumius Megellus, who demanded reparations from the Tarentines for the destruction of four of the Roman galleys, the taking of another, and the butchering of the Roman crews. I also spoke of the insults that were heaped upon Posthumius by the Tarentines and of the drunken Philonides who stood at the exit of the theater as Posthumius prepared to uh, retire and being full of the wine of being full of yesterday's wine bespattered the Romans toga with filth this created a great deal of amusement among the Tarentines, and uh, the theater uh, rocked with their laughter. Postumius exclaimed, uh, laugh. Laugh while you may, Tarentines, for long will be the time when you will weep hereafter. It will take not a little blood to wash this robe. The Tarentines, as we noted, called in the king of Epirus, Pyrrhus, a great Greek general. We noted the Battle of Heraclea in 280, the Battle of Asculum in 279, in both of which battles, Pyrrhus was victorious, but he had suffered severe losses. He was defeated at the Battle of Beneventum in uh, 275, and so struck with admiration for Roman valor was Paris that he exclaimed how easy it were for me to win the empire of the world if I had an army of Romans or for the Romans to win if they had me as their king. We noted then that in 272, Tarentum fell. And this completed the uh, domination of the entire Italian peninsula by the Romans. With the uh, unification of Italy, Rome entered upon a new era in her foreign relations. The city-state of Carthage at this time was the dominant power 
in the Mediterranean. Carthage was located here on the northern coast of Africa, about where the city of Tunis is today. Carthage uh, had been a colony of the uh, Phoenician city of Tyre. And uh, when the Phoenician cities in Asia Minor had passed under the control of the Babylonians in the sixth century and uh, had been incorporated into the Persian Empire, Carthage and other of the Phoenician settlements uh, severed their ties with their homeland. Carthage had been founded uh, in the latter part of the 8th century and uh, in the minds of uh, some historians had been founded a century earlier in 814, the latter part of the 9th century. Carthage uh, was a, a trading power. She was not uh, militaristically aggressive. She depended upon her prosperity. Uh, she de depended upon trade and commerce for her prosperity. And she dominated the western Mediterranean from uh, Sicily to the Strait of Gibraltar and north and south thereof in the Atlantic. Having a commercial monopoly in the western Mediterranean, it was necessary for Carthage to be a naval um, power. And she was the undisputed mistress of the seas from the Strait of Messina here in northeast Sicily uh, to the Strait of Gibraltar and beyond north and south. She possessed most of Sif Sicily except for the town of Messina on the northeast coast and Syracuse in the southeast. She also possessed Sardinia, Corsica, the Balearic Islands, the other islands in the western Mediterranean, uh, most of Iberia, now Spain, from which she received agricultural products, silver, copper, and iron. She received uh, tin from um, what is now England, and ivory and gold from the west coast of Africa. Carthage, uh, unlike Rome, had no organized national army. She depended upon uh, mercenaries recruited from warlike people such as the Spaniards, the Libyans, and the Gauls. So this was the, the state which Rome now faced following her conquering of southern Italy. This was the power with which uh, Rome would enter into war in the challenge for dominion of the seas west of the Strait of Messina. The first war between uh, Rome and Carthage grew out of the political situation in Sicily where a band of mercenaries had occupied the city of Messina and had become a menace to their neighbors, the Syracusans. King Hiero of Syracuse uh, was at the point of conquering Messina when the Campanians 
appealed to the Carthaginians for assistance. The, Carthag the Carthaginians responded by establishing a garrison in Messina. And it wasn't long before the Campanian mercenaries who called themselves the Mamertines realized that they had slipped from the, uh, out of the frying pan into the fire because the Carthaginians showed no indications of, of leaving. The uh, Campanian mercenaries therefore appealed to Rome to help them to get rid of the, uh, the Carthaginians. Well, the Roman Senate was quick to note that the occupation of Messina by the Carthaginians would uh, put the Carthaginians in control of the Strait of Messina and would constitute a perpetual threat to southern Italy and eventually to Rome itself. Therefore, the Roman Senate levied, uh, authorized the levy of two Roman legions and they were dispatched to, to Sicily. In, uh, this was in 264 uh, BC. This was the beginning of the first Punic War. There were three Punic Wars, so designated by Cicero. Actually, the, it was one continuous war, one war extending from 264 BC to 146 BC, a total of 118 years. But the first stage of the war, we'll refer to as the first Punic War, lasted from 264 to 241 uh, BC. So Rome found itself at war with Carthage in 264 BC. By 261 BC, the Roman Senate realized the necessity for creating a large naval fleet which could challenge the naval supremacy of, of Carthage. And uh, they used as their model a Carthaginian uh, warship uh, which had washed ashore and been left uh, stranded. And uh, within a few months, the Romans had built 120 vessels, of which 100 were quinquiremes and 20 were triremes. The triremes were manned by 150 rowers, each manipulating, each manipulating one oar. The quinquiremes were, um, had a complement of 300 uh, rowers and 120 fighting men. The quinquireme had huge oars, each manned by five rowers. So the quinquireme was the first class battleship of the day. Quite an undertaking for the Romans, who had never before uh, had warships, never before had a, had a navy. Well, in 260 BC, a Roman consul by the name of Gaius Duilius, Gaius Duilius, fought a naval, naval battle. He challenged a superior Carthaginian fleet off Miley, which is the northeastern tip of Sicily, and uh, destroyed the Carthaginian fleet. It was a victory as decisive as it was uh, surprising. In 256 BC, uh, the Romans landed uh, a consul and his consular army in Africa. His name was um, Marcus Atilius Regulus, and he at first was victorious over the over the Carthaginians, but in 255 BC, BC, he met with a very serious disaster uh, in connection with which he himself was taken prisoner. In 249, and, and I should say that the Romans treated their Roman, uh, the, the Romans treated their Carthaginian uh, prisoners with consideration, except for Regulus, whom they 
kept in, in a state of utter misery. They uh, gave him just enough food to stay alive, and they constantly paraded a huge elephant uh, near him so as to frighten him and uh, allow him no peace of body or mind. And in 249, the Carthag Carthaginians decided to send uh, some envoys to Rome to propose uh, peace. And uh, they sent uh, Marcus Atilius Regulus, the Roman consul, along with the, the uh, envoys, uh, believing that their object would be gained by virtue of the standing and valor of, of this man. When Regulus was uh, brought into the Senate, Senate House, he explained to the Romans that he had been sent with the envoys to make overtures for peace that would be pleasing to both parties, if possible. And if, if this were not possible, then to effect an exchange of prisoners. The Carthaginians had exacted from Regulus before he left Carthage an oath to return to Carthage without fail. The Roman Senate asked Regulus what his opinion was. And Regulus, according to uh, Cassius Dio Coxianus, uh, answered, as I am a prisoner of the Carthaginians, my body is a Carthaginian chattel, but my spirit is yours. As a captive, I belong to the Carthaginians. Yet inasmuch as I met with misfortune, not from cowardice, but from zeal, I am not only a Roman, but I also have your cause at heart. Not in one single respect do I consider reconciliation advantageous to you. The Roman Senate then, out of consideration for Regulus's safety, showed a disposition to free the captives, whereupon uh, Regulus explained his reasons for believing that the rejection of the Carthaginian proposals was in the interests of the Romans. He said, I know that manifest destruction awaits me, for it is impossible to keep the Carthaginians from learning my advice to you. Even so, I esteem my country's advantage over my own safety. Then when the Roman consuls uh, suggested that Regulus remain in Rome and not return to Carthage as a prisoner, Regulus answered, I have sworn to them my return, and I will not transgress my oaths, not even when they have been given to enemies. He was determined, therefore, not to violate his oath. And when he was departing, when he was departing, in the company of the Carthaginian of the Carthaginian envoys, his wife and little children clung to him tearfully, and the Senate told Regulus that they would not surrender him if he chose to stay. But inasmuch as he was determined to keep the oath that he had given. He was sent back to Carthage and was tortured to death. 
They cut off his eyelids and cast him into a specially constructed enclosure bristling with spikes and made him face the sun. And therefore, from his suffering and sleeplessness, because the spikes would not allow him to recline in any fashion, he perished. Now, Mr. President, this is, is an example of a Roman who valued his oath above his life. Montesquieu said that the Romans were the most religious people in the world when it came to an oath, which always formed the nerve of their military discipline. Mr. President, the Constitution of the United States, under Article VI, requires senators, representatives, members of the state legislatures, the judiciary, state, and federal to take an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. An oath, a solemn oath. Many times I've stood at that desk and taken the oath. Six times I've stood there and, and taken that oath, held up my hand before God and man to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And many times I've stood at that desk as a presiding officer and administered the oath to senators, entering upon the office of senator. Sen uh, uh, of senator. How serious do we take this oath? Sometimes I wonder if we give it a second thought if we ever think of it after we've taken that oath, until the next six years have passed and we take it again if we are reelected upon re-entering the office of Senate. That Constitution provides that the power of the purse shall be invested in the Congress of the United States. The power of the purse. That Constitution, Article 6, requires us to take the oath. Article 1 vests in this Congress the power of the purse. We swear before God, our Maker, Creator of life and life eternal, and before man, that we will support and defend that Constitution. And yet there are those who would support the shifting of that power over the purse, at least in part, to the chief executive. Now, we ought to be serious about that oath. And we ought to remember that it's the Constitution as Marshall said, that we are expounding the Constitution, which requires that the power of the purse be vested here. Well, Regulus was true to his oath. In 247, Hamilcar Barker, a new general was appointed to the command in Sicily. He infused new life, new enthusiasm into the Carthaginian cause. And he was a military gen uh, genius. And he kept the Romans at bay for the next six years until in 242, a Roman fleet under Lutatius Catulus destroyed a Carthaginian relief expedition uh, at the Battle of the Egates Islands, just west of northern Sicily. And it was impossible then for the Carthaginians to prolong the struggle further 
in view of the fact that they were completely cut off in Sicily. Therefore, Carthage had to sue for peace, uh, and peace was restored in 241 BC. The result of this war was that Carthage gave up Sicily. Immediately uh, following uh, peace, a war broke out in Carthage uh, because the mercenaries who had been employed by the government of Carthage to fight the Romans in Sicily were not paid in accordance with the promises of the Carthaginian government. So that there, there then occurred the Mercenary War, or the Libyan War, which lasted three years. And uh, the mercenaries were finally cruelly put down by Hamilcar Barca. Uh, during this uh, time, when Carthage was suffering its in extremis, the Roman Senate saw the opportunity to take advantage of Carthage's vulnerabilities and seize Sardinia and Corsica. And that uh, occurred. In uh, 237 BC, the Romans dispatched a new army, uh, or the Carthaginians dispatched a new army under the command of Hamilcar Barca, this brilliant military tactician, to Iberia, to Spain. And for eight years, Hamilcar Barca, through the art of diplomacy and also through the making of war, um, reduced many of the Iberian tribes to uh, loyalty uh, to Carthage. In 229, Hamilcar Barca died in a manner that was worthy of his great achievements uh, when he was uh, killed in a battle with uh, the most warlike and powerful of tribes, uh, during which battle he showed a conspicuous and even reckless um, gallantry. Upon his death, the Carthaginians then invested his son-in-law, uh, Hasdrubal, Hasdrubal with the command, and Hasdrubal uh, continued to subject the Iberian tribes uh, to the domination of Carthage uh, for the next eight years. Hasdrubal founded New Carthage right here on the southern coast of Spain. He was assassinated in his own house at night by a Celt in revenge for some private wrong. wrong. After which, Hannibal, Hannibal was invested with the command in Spain. Hannibal had been sworn by his father, Hamilcar Barca, on their way to Spain to forever have en enmity toward Rome. Hamilcar Barker had taken Hannibal to the altar and, and, had, and had had him place his hand upon the sacrificial victim and swear an oath that he would never be a friend of Rome. And so Hannibal inherited this fierce and bitter hatred uh, for Rome. Hannibal continued to bring the Iberian tribes under submission, and he laid siege to Saguntum. Saguntum was an old town with uh, Cyclopean walls, well defended. Um, it uh, was commanded by a pro-Roman faction, an anti-Carthaginian element, and Rome, therefore, had, uh, in effect, um, an enclave right here in Iberia. Hannibal laid siege to Saguntum, and it was bravely defended for eight months, but it finally fell uh, 
with the in inevitable rapid and massacre that marked the end of long disputed sieges in ancient times. Well, the Romans, the Roman Senate then dispatched uh, an envoy to Carthage to inquire as to whether or not Hannibal had acted on his own initiative or whether he had acted under the orders of, of Carthage. If uh, Carthage disavowed the actions of Hannibal, then he would have to be surrendered over to the hands of the Roman authorities. But Carthage refused to surrender Hannibal. And the Carthaginian representatives then asked the Roman am ambassador what his intentions were. The Roman, who was uh, named uh, Marcus Fabius Buto, B-U-T-E-O, Buto, uh, placed his hand uh, under his toga. And he said, I hold in my hand both war and peace. Which will you choose? The Carthaginians, after some consultation, returned and, and told the Roman that he himself should make the decision. Whereupon he, in a very melodramatic gesture, let fall his hand and, and said, I let fall war. The Carthaginians uh, uh, responded, we accept. And so in this very casual manner, there began what uh, Titus Livius, the Roman uh, historian, referred to as the most memorable of all wars, the Second Punic War, the most memorable of all wars. Hmm. There were three Barca brothers in Spain, Hannibal, Hasdrubal, and Mago. Mago was the youngest of the three brothers. Hasdrubal is not to be confused with the now deceased son-in-law of Hamilcar Barca. These three brothers were known as the lion's brood throughout the army. And they had prepared the most audacious audacious military move in history. An invasion of Italy by way of the forbidding and hitherto untried passage over the Alps. No one had conceived that a whole army could be moved from the west and through the treacherous Alpine passes down into Italy. It would be, of course, a uh, little short of sheer madness, but the intrepid Carthaginian Hannibal, remember, Napoleon, had said that he, he had placed Hannibal higher than any other general in antiquity. This intrepid Carthaginian determined that where there was no way he would make one, and he did. In the spring of uh, 218 BC, with most of Iberia south of the Abro River united behind him, Hannibal was ready for the departure. Hasdrubal was to remain in Iberia, Spain, to uh, keep control over the Iberian uh, tribes and to protect uh, Carthaginian commerce. Mago was to accompany Hannibal. So in the early spring of 218 BC, Hannibal set out. He traversed the wild Pyrenees, the unknown lands 
populated by barbarian savages in southern Gaul. The fearsome Alps and uh, appeared on the plains of the Po River Valley five months later. Polybius, the, the, the historian, says that the actual passage over the Alps required 15 days. And that uh, Hannibal reached the valley of the Patus River with such of his army as had survived. Hannibal had sustained great losses of men and horses and pack animals during the terrible journey over the Alps, in which uh, he was faced with storms, heavy snows, ice, traveling over treacherous precipices and through dangerous passes, confronted with heavy winds, rock slides, sub-zero temperatures, and miserable conditions of hunger. It had proved impossible to carry a full supply of food for so many thousands over such mountains. And much of, what the, which, much of what they did bring was lost together with the beasts of burden that uh, carried it. Hannibal's men had uh, given up all care, care for their health. And they suffered terribly from the abandonment of proper attention to physical necessities. Whereas uh, Hannibal had crossed the Rhone River with 46,000 men. He reached the valley of the Po with only 26,000. He had lost almost half of his army in the pass. Napoleon said of Hannibal, he bought his battlefield. With the pay of half of his army. At the price of half his army. He bought his battlefield at the price of half his army. His survivors through their terrible sufferings, had taken on the appearance of savages. Hannibal, therefore, spent his whole energies in restoring the spirits and the bodies of his men and their animals, among which were three dozen emaciated elephants. Think of that, bringing elephants over the Alps. And as soon as his men and their animals had sufficiently recuperated, he made it his task to attack the nearby cities because now he was up against the tough, disciplined armies of Rome. And he felt it was necessary to convince the Gauls of northern Italy that he was the man 
with whom to join. So he rapidly attacked uh, the cities, put to the sword all those who resisted him, and uh, welcomed to his standard all who would join. Now these uh, simple successes were, they achieved um, their purpose because thousands of Gauls in the surrounding area joined the ranks of, of Hannibal. Two Roman consuls in November 218, by the name of Publius Cornelius Scipio and Tiberius Sempronius Longus advanced to grapple with Hannibal. Before their two armies could unite, Scipio bridged the Ticinus River. Bridged the Ticinus River. He'd gotten his troops across when Hannibal, with his cavalry, attacked and outflanked the Romans, and they withdrew in confusion. But Hannibal, Hannibal was hard upon their heels and he captured 600 of the Romans. Moreover, in view of this cavalry encounter, 2,000 Gauls revolted from their, against their Roman masters and went over to Hannibal. Scipio had been uh, severely wounded in this cavalry exchange. And this, together with the disturbing defection of 2,000 Gauls, influenced his decision not to enter into a major battle with Hannibal until he had been joined with his fellow consul, Sempronius Longus. Meanwhile, The nearby storage depot at Clastidium was betrayed into the hands of Hannibal by the commander of the, of the town. And its granary served the Carthaginians well as the cold northern, as the cold winter of northern Italy set in. Sempronius then in December, hastened to join Scipio. Sempronius was an ambitious man. He was overly eager to give battle to Hannibal before his consular term expired. Well, Hannibal, from the very beginning of the campaign, months and months and months and months prior thereto, had maintained a, an espionage system in Italy. And it was upon the suspected ambition of Sempronius Longus and his desire for a quick victory over Hannibal that Hannibal based his strategy. Hannibal knew how to make the terrain work for him. And knowing of Sempronius's desire for a quick victory, Hannibal set up an ambuscade, lured the whole Roman army across the Trebia, the Trebia River, and into the flatland where Hannibal's troops were drawn up for battle. The trap was set. And when the two armies came to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, Mago, the, young, the youngest of the three Barca brothers, emerged from a concealed area with 1,000 horsemen and 1,000 foot soldiers. 
and fell upon the rear of the Roman armies. It was a set piece battle. A model of care and preparation. A triumph of strategy and tactical planning. The Romans were outgeneraled. And their army of 40,000 men was cut to pieces. Thousands of Romans and thousands of their allied forces were killed at the Trebia River. The cavalry encounter at the Ticinus River was but the first peremptory tap upon an ominous drum. But the rout and the destruction of two Roman consular armies at the Trebia River was no murmur of thunder in the distant hills. It was the deep rumble of an advancing avalanche that would shake Italy to its foundation. Hannibal was wounded in the battle, but despite his wound, he captured the uh, large uh, trading post of Vitumili. Vitumili. He captured the large trading post. And he met with a hostile population of Gauls who opposed his attack upon the town. He routed the Gauls and completely exterminated them, massacred them. Because it was vital that the Gauls of northern Italy understand that fortune and freedom lay with joining the Carthaginians. And that if he was opposed, he could be even more merciless than could the Romans. Hannibal's relations with uh, the Gauls were all important for his success in the years ahead. He promised them, as he promised the men who had followed him from Spain. All of the lands they con conquered, the booty of Italy, and the wealth of Rome. These were the men on, he, uh, on whom he would have to depend for the bulk of his army in the years to come because he had no other manpower reserve. He was cut off from his base in Spain, and the Carthaginian gov government never sent him any supplies, never reinforced his, his army. These were the men, therefore, that he had to convinced with his cunning, his intelligence, his skill, and his courage. At the same time, he had to seduce away from Rome her non-Roman Italian allies, the Latins, and so on. If he could break up the, confeder the confederation of Italian states, he would take away 
the manpower reserves upon which Rome also had to depend. And he would isolate Rome. In 218, uh, 217 BC, two new consuls, Gaius Flaminius and Nius Servilius Geminus, were chosen. And in view of the fact that the two existing consular armies, the two existing Roman consular armies, had been destroyed at the Battle of the Trebia River, four new legions were levied. I should state at this point that a Roman consular army consisted of two legions, each made up of from 4,200 to 6,000 men, if they were fully fleshed out, 6,000 men, five to 6,000 men, and 300 cavalry. A praetor had control over one legion, and along with the legions, there was an equal, no equal number of Italian allies. Consequently, a Roman consul commanded two Roman legions, amounting to 10 to 12,000 men, together with an equal number of allied forces. Therefore, a consular army was made up of 20 to 25,000 men. And two consuls, two consular armies, therefore, commanded 40 to 50,000 men, or maybe a few more. Sempronius was hostile toward the Roman Senate. And he also was eager to join battle with Hannibal. He had quite a high opinion of his own military prowess because of a previous successful military campaign against the Gauls. But he was up against probably the master military genius of all time, Hannibal. Hannibal set out for Etruria, which was to the south. But he chose a route that the Romans would never have anticipated crossing the marshes of the lower Arno River. Out right here on the map. Marching three continuous days and nights in water. Only one of the 37 animals uh, that had um, accompanied Hannibal across the Alps remained. And Hannibal rode that elephant. It was here that Hannibal lost an eye. And Juvenal, that uh, Roman satirical poet, referred to Hannibal as the one-eyed commander on his monstrous beast. But Hannibal had stolen a brilliant march over Flaminius and Geminus. Far to the east, 
Geminus and his troops. watched the roads and passes along the Adriatic. To the south, Flaminius was at Eretium, barring the roads to Rome. But Hannibal never intended to confront his enemies on a field of their own choosing, not a field of his choosing. And so he, he bypassed Flaminius. He bypassed Flaminius and moved toward Lake Trasimeno. Lake Trasimeno. Where his military genius quickly perceived that nature's terrain was ideal for a trap designed for slaughter. He arrived in advance of Flaminius. Lake Trasimene is shown on the chart. At this point on Lake Trasimene, on the borders of Lake Trasimene, there was a narrow defile through which the road ran into the valley, into a narrow valley. Hannibal, as I say, arrived in advance of Flaminius. Hannibal set up his encampment on a hill at the far end of the valley. It was a steep hill. It was in full view of the entrance at the narrow defile. Hannibal set, his, set up his encampment on that hill and he stationed his Spanish and African infantry troops in front of the hill and then extending in order toward the entrance, he placed his Balearic slingers and his other light arm troops under the cover of the hills. And farther along and toward the entrance, he stationed his Gauls and the cavalry. Having made his elaborate uh, preparations then, Hannibal remained quiet and waited. The trap was set. Flaminius came along later in the day and he saw that Hannibal's camp was on the hill at the other end of the valley. And inasmuch as darkness was coming on, Flaminius pitched his camp near the entrance to the valley. The next morning at daybreak, Flaminius moved his forces forward into the valley along the narrow defile and proceeding by the side of Lake Transamini, Transamini, Transamini. he moved his forces forward toward the encampment at the far end with the idea in view that he would uh, engage Hannibal at the far end of the valley. When the forces of Flaminius were almost all within the valley and they were, the forward forces were almost upon Hannibal, he gave the signal to attack. And when the trumpet sound rever reverberated through that valley, the trap was sprung. And Hannibal's troops 
who were lying in ambush behind the hills, delivered an assault upon the Roman columns, and the assault came at every point at once. Front, rear, and flank. Flaminius was uh, taken by complete surprise. Hannibal's forces came down from the hills and attacked at all points at once. And the Romans were under the utmost distress and danger. Polybius says in his history that 15,000 Romans died in the valley that day. Those who were caught in the defile died in a most horrible manner. Pressed as they were into the lake by the Gauls and the cavalry of Hannibal. In their frantic terror, many of them endeavored to swim with their armor on and were drowned. The greater number, however, waded into the lake as far as they could go and remained there with their heads above the water. When the Carthaginian cavalry rode in after them and they saw death staring them in the face, they held up their hands, offered to surrender, and begged for mercy. The Carthaginian cavalry dispatched them except for those Romans who preferred to inflict the, the, the mortal blow on themselves. And so they died. Flaminius, the consul, was killed. His body was never found. And when the disastrous news reached Rome, the Romans were called to assemble. The praetor, announced the gravity of the blow. We have been defeated in a great battle. Mr. President, throughout the, the Punic Wars, we saw and we will see that it was the Roman Senate that led the Roman people through every trial to victory. Mr. President, I yield the floor.